Hey folks, this is a very special episode. I get to talk to the legend Phil Zimmerman today. Phil, if you don't know, we're going to go over his background, but he is a legendary cypherpunk, and we also get to learn a lot of the background of his story, his fight for releasing PGP, which is some of the most widely used email encryption software in the world. We also talk about another legend, Hal Finney, who is a dear friend of Phil and also an employee of his at PGP Inc. for a very long time. So I'm really, really excited for you guys to be able to enjoy this episode. Uh, right now, the date is the, it's going to be the 5th of May, 2019, when this episode is released. The month of May, we're going to be launching a donation pledge campaign for Hal Finney. I'll talk about it again in the middle, in the, the end of this episode, but this is a very, very special thing for me. Hal Finney, if you don't know, is probably the second most important person in Bitcoin besides Satoshi Nakamoto. We lost um, Hal, though, in 2014 to ALS. And I want to do what we did back in 2014, 2015, which is raise money for ALS awareness and keep Hal's memory alive. So if you'd go over to BitcoinForALS.com, that's BitcoinForALS.com, you can sign up for the email list or just follow us on Twitter with the handle at Bitcoin for ALS, but the number four, Bitcoin, the number four ALS. And we are going to be doing some very cool stuff. This is all done uh, with partnership with Hal's wife, uh, Fran, as well as the ALS Association, um, uh, the Golden West ALS Association, which is where all the donations are going to go, uh, which is the family's wishes. Uh, we're going to have some very cool stuff. We're going to have a bunch of prizes we're going to give out to supporters and donors. It's going to be launching in a couple weeks, and it's going to be some very cool stuff. So I don't want to go any longer. It's already been two minutes on this intro. So I really quick want to say thank you to everybody who is listening right now and enjoy the show. I know you're going to. Today, I'm honored to welcome Phil Zimmerman, most well known as the creator of the popular encryption program, Pretty Good Privacy, or PGP for short. He is a longtime peace activist, founder of PGP Inc., and co-founder and chief scientist for the encrypted communications firm, Silent Circle. Mr. Zimmerman, welcome to the show. My pleasure to be here. So I'd like to start out by kind of hearing about actually your early life. Um, where did you grow up and, and how did you first become kind of interested and, you know, just the, the computers and, and computer security in the first place? Uh, well, when I was in college, I studied uh, physics. And um, but I found that I was spending more time playing with computers than I was uh, doing physics. So I thought it would be good to uh, get some academic credit for what I was spending all my time doing. So I switched majors. And what was uh, as far as for kind of getting into the the cypherpunk circles and and uh, and and digital security. Um, where did you kind of first get into that? Was that around the same time? And and what, what kind of piqued your interest and in, and in wanting to kind of uh, uh, move in move in that direction? Well, I I've been interested in cryptography since I was a kid. I I think I first started looking at it when I was about ten years old. Um, I read a children's book on um, on uh, codes and secret writing. You know, and, it, you know, they were just simple things for kids. Um, substitution ciphers and uh, writing with invisible ink made from lemon juice and things, you know, little trivial things like that. Um, but when I got to the uh, university in uh, 1972, um, it, you know, almost as soon as I started programming in, in basic, I... Uh, I I started uh, writing programs to uh, to encrypt things, um, and then and then you know and then on to Fortran and other languages. And I always wanted to play with you know software to encrypt things, but there wasn't any way to make any meaningful use of it at that time. Um, and also, my knowledge of cryptography at that time was quite rudimentary and naive. Um, 
So um, when I became a software engineer, uh, I, as I developed my career along those lines, it really wasn't about cryptography. It was mostly embedded systems, real-time embedded systems. That was around the same time that microprocessors were starting to appear in the late 70s. Um, and so that was, you know, that was an exciting time. Um, but it wasn't until um, uh, the late 80s that I started writing an encryption software that had more substance, uh, like a, a, an implementation of RSA. And I know that you were, um, you know, part of the PGP story is that you, you were involved in um, the anti-nuclear uh, weapons peace movement in, in the 80s, you know, that and that kind of directly led to the uh, genesis of, of your development of PGP. Can you tell us kind of more about like those times and why you felt it was necessary for yourself, you know, and, and other activists uh, to be able to in, encrypt their communications? Well, that was, um, you know, in the final years of the Cold War, uh, things looked pretty bad. Um, uh, everybody was worried about nuclear war. There was an active uh, peace movement in the United States to stop the arms race, the nuclear weapons freeze campaign. Um, and I felt that um, encryption software could be useful for grassroots political organizations that wanted to protect themselves against their own government. Uh, at that time, um, the you know the Reagan administration had an adversarial relationship with the U.S. peace movement, and so I felt that this would be a useful technology to protect uh, grassroots uh, political movements against uh, um, against government surveillance. So, so anyway, that, but, that I, but I didn't have time to work on cryptography at that time uh, because I was spending a lot of my time. Uh, I was teaching a class in the nuclear arms race uh, and uh, doing uh, a lot of other mobilization for uh, stopping the arms race. So I had to wait till later before I could uh, start. It wasn't until the end of the Cold War that I could start uh really developing uh, encryption software. And I started working on the beginnings of PGP in the late 80s. And then w with your development of, of PGP, because a lot, of, I, I think, you know, like we, we talked about uh, um, b before the uh, episode started was that I think that uh, a lot of people uh, coming into, I mean, the, the concept of digital security and privacy right now is starting to become um, important again. Um, for a while there, I think a lot of people made a lot of trade-offs uh, with their yeah. privacy online and it's starting to become important again. And I think a lot of people, you know, uh, even people my age, I'm, I'm 35, um, are, are not aware if they haven't gotten interested in it in a lot of the, the background of the story of of kind of some of these early fights for digital privacy. Um, so, so if you could uh, may, maybe kind of go over the development of PGP and then what led to uh, the criminal case that was brought against you and and uh how how you fought that okay uh well i um i developed pgp in the uh early 90s um and um published it on the internet uh well with the help of uh other people published it on the internet and um it was free um i wanted it to be widely deployed because if it was widely deployed, then it would become more difficult for the government to outlaw uh, encryption. I had reason to worry about the government outlawing encryption because there was some uh, sense of Congress resolution in, in uh, the early 90s that uh, there should be backdoors in communication systems. And so I wanted to preempt that uh, becoming illegal by, um, by getting PGP widely circulated. Um, this prompted a, um, a three-year criminal investigation because PGP spread overseas on the internet, which at that time the government felt was a violation of the Arms Export Control Act. At that time, a strong encryption software was on the munitions list. And that meant that it was not legal to export. It's like exporting Stinger missiles, you know, um, 
And so um, it took a whole decade, really, to change the laws so that encryption software was no longer regarded as a condition. But for three years, um, my uh, struggle with those laws was more personal. It was uh, trying to stay out of prison. So there was this three-year criminal investigation, which had the unintended side effect of making PGP more popular. And uh, even though it was a miserable experience at the time, it was in retrospect good for my career. Um, it made me more popular. In fact, during the decade of the 90s, almost every article, I'm um, uh, sorry, almost every issue of Wired Magazine had something about PGP or me. Every time they ran an article about, you know, the, the export controls on encryption, they would have some mention of me. Well, that yeah, that's why I think uh, you know that your their, your case was so important, and and uh, I mean, if I I guess I didn't say it before, but I think on on behalf of myself and, and the listeners, want to thank you for fighting that fight because it was not, you know, it was not definitely anything that was uh, 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 for sure on how the uh, end result uh, was going to be, and uh, it, it was quite a quite an undertaking. I don't think a lot of people understand the the kind of pressure that that would be put somebody under how did uh how did that end up uh, becoming resolved in the end because they brought the criminal case against you after you published it on the internet but why um what what occurrences happened that kind of brought that to, to them dropping that case well we had a pretty active um uh, legal defense team um and we um we managed the case pretty well i think um it went on for three years. Uh, uh, we we did things like uh, publish the PGP source code in a book published by MIT Press, in a, a prestigious academic press that, um, uh, you know, uh, by publishing the source code in a book that could be exported. We felt that it would help us at trial if I was indicted. Um, and so... Um, and, and I did a lot of public speaking at that time. And I talked to the press uh, almost every day, maybe five press interviews a week. This is most unusual for the target of the criminal investigation, most legal. Uh, most lawyers don't allow their clients to talk to the press. But we felt that it was helpful um, because it, it, you know, it, it got a lot of public support and um, um, it sort of energized um, opposition to the to those policies of uh, export controls and also domestic controls. There, there were no domestic controls, but the FBI was attempting to um, impose domestic controls. Uh, they developed a, a special chip that they wanted to put into people's telephones called the Clipper chip, and this chip uh, would encrypt your phone calls. And it had a back door for government surveillance. And uh, the FBI was shocked, shocked <laughs> that the free market did not respond favorably to such a, uh, a technology. People did not embrace it. Now, I, I, I remember when I was reading about uh, the story of PGP, I thought it was, it was such a, a beautiful chess move where uh, you mentioned briefly about publishing it, but if if I'm not mistaken, isn't wasn't that kind of one of the the checkmate moves in that the by publishing on the internet is is where they decided to come after you for exporting it, but there was no prohibition for print, and so by that's right by printing it and sending it out via books, it was perfectly legal, but it was accomplishing the same thing. Well, yeah, it's actually a little bit more complicated story. Okay. Uh, what, during my criminal investigation, um, uh, there was a guy uh, who worked at Qualcomm in San Diego, a guy named Bill Karn, an engineer, who bought a copy of uh, uh, Bruce Schneier's book, Applied Cryptography. He just, uh, he didn't have any connection with, with uh, Schneier. He just simply went to the local bookstore and purchased a copy of the book like anyone else could do. And then he, um, and then he sent the book in to um, the, um, the government uh, applying for a commodities jurisdiction. Uh, that is a permission from the government to treat the, this as uh, not subject to 
the State Department's rules about export controls, but rather the Commerce Department, um, which there are no export controls for books. And and the um, he wanted them to declare that uh, that it was okay for him to export this book, which had some cryptographic source code in, in an appendix. Um, it was the data encryption standard written in C in an appendix. And so they um, they said, sure, you can export this. Why are you bothering us with such a trivial matter? Uh, we have no export controls regarding books. Um, and so he said, well, thank you very much. And as soon as they gave him that commodity jurisdiction, which said that the Commerce Department had control of it rather than the State Department, and thus was not subject to export controls, he then sent a floppy disk containing the exact same source code that was in the appendix of the book to uh, the State Department saying, uh, okay, now I'd like the commodity jurisdiction for the contents of this floppy disk. And uh, they said, no, you can't. Uh, a floppy disk is different. And he said, but it's the same thing that's in the book. It's exactly the same source code. In fact, it's not even the whole book. You already said yes to the book. This is a subset of the book. And they said, no, you can't. Um, <clears throat> and so he appealed it, and he went through a few layers of administrative appeals, and then he sued them in federal court. Um, and so the State Department was a de defendant in a, in a federal lawsuit from Phil Karn um, to, you know, to export a floppy disk containing the same source code that was in Schneier's book. Uh, and it was in that context that when Bob Pryor from MIT Press approached me at a uh, Black Hat conference uh, and asked me if I could um, have the PGP user's guide published by MIT Press, I said, sure, let's do that. But could we also do a second book, a book containing uh, all of the source code for PGP? Um, and uh, that was a most unusual thing to do. <laughs> Because it's like 800 pages of source code, and uh, including the make files, you know, is all the source code. Um, and so they agreed to do it. Um, and I was going to apply for a commodity jurisdiction for this book uh, from MIT Press, or have MIT Press uh, do it for me. And so they did. And uh, this time, the State Department realized that they had already walked into a trap with Bill Karn. Uh, and they knew that, in this case, it was a much more extreme example because the book was, con instead of containing a couple of subroutines for the data encryption center, it contained from top to bottom every line of code in the source, the body of source code for PGP, including the make files for building it. And um, and so they knew that they could, they you know, that they were trapped. They couldn't say yes because they knew what was going to happen next, I would then send them a floppy disk, like Bill Karn had done. And they couldn't say no, because they can't prohibit the publication of a book, or not even to export the book. MIT Press sells all of their books in other countries, you know. And so um, they asked the NSA what to do, and the NSA said, well, you better not say yes. And... <laughs> The State Department knew they couldn't say no either, so they didn't reply at all. Meanwhile, MIT Press proceeded to export the book, um, and they ran out the clock. Um, they never responded to the to the CJ request, the Commodity Jurisdiction request from uh, from MIT Press. After the um, after the government dropped their case against me. In early 1996, uh, I started a, a, a company, PGP Inc., to commercialize PGP. Um, and uh, our strategy was to publish the source code in a book again, except this time it would be a book that we actually intended to be scanned by OCR in Europe. Um, in theory, you could have scanned the MIT Press book with uh, optical character recognition. But it would probably have a lot of errors in it. We didn't care anyway because we were that software was already overseas. But in this case, with the commercial company, 
we didn't release the software in any other form except printed in a book. And we carefully designed the book. You know, we, we used a special font that was optimized for uh, OCR. Uh, in fact, it was OCRB. Um, and um, it was scanned in in Europe. Uh, it, but it took a thousand man hours to scan 5,000 pages because there's a lot of errors. Um, you see, when you scan, when you use OCR to scan uh, text, um, you resolve ambiguities and errors in the scan by using spelling dictionaries. That works for English or French. It doesn't work so well for C source code. So there was a huge number of errors in the scan. So they had to be hand, hand corrected. And that's why it took a thousand man hours to fix a 5,000 pages of, of source code. So we realized that we'd made a mistake technically on that. So we, we asked for all the notes from the European team that was scanning it to tell us exactly what kind of errors they were seeing. And then we wrote some special software tools to resolve these things with some kind of heuristics that would have um, used probabilistic tables to change errors to you know what we thought would be the correct um, patterns. And it went from 1,000 man hours to 30 man hours. Um, so this was a highly successful piece of software. And we, in this software that corrects the errors from OCR scanning, we actually published that in a second book called Tools for Publishing Source Code via OCR. And that had these software tools uh, printed on the pages using the same format. So it was actually a bootstrappable book. Uh, you know, you scanned the first page and that contained it contained a Perl script that was smart enough to scan in the rest of the book. Um, <laughs> which had a whole bunch of C source code that did a very sophisticated um, substitution of these error syndromes. And then we use that to scan thousands and thousands of pages of C source code at high speed. Uh, and it, it blew a hole in the export controls. It became possible to export arbitrarily large amounts of C source code containing cryptographic software uh, without without being blocked by uh, export controls. Uh, and so finally the government gave up at the end of the 90s. They finally dropped their export controls. In 2000, uh, they lifted the export controls. So it took pretty much the whole decade to do this, to get them to change the laws. But after that, uh, strong encryption software uh, became entrenched in many aspects of technology. Every web browser had strong encryption software after that. When you do your online banking or e-commerce, you're using strong encryption that's embedded in the browser. Your mail clients use a strong encryption to talk to the mail server through TLS, the same thing that your web browser does. Um, and uh, strong encryption is everywhere now. And the laws have changed too. It's not just that they ended the export controls. But they changed other laws as well. They made it so that instead of having to explain yourself, if you're using strong encryption, like you have to justify using strong encryption, that was what you had to do back in the 90s. Now, you have to explain yourself if you're not using strong encryption. You know, you have to protect company records with strong encryption. You know, if, you, if you're a businessman who loses his laptop in a taxi, uh, and it's got 200,000 customer names on the disk. Uh, if those, if if they're not in, encrypted with strong encryption, you have to disclose publicly this breach of customer identities, which you know is a very disruptive thing to do. And so, really, strong encryption has now become entrenched not only in the deployed, uh, you know, worldwide infrastructure of software, but it's also become entrenched in our legal system. Now it's expected that we have to use, we're compelled to use strong encryption. And looking at, at today's climate compared to uh, in, in the 90s, what do you view uh, kind of the current 
privacy and security climate as now. I mean, you kind of touched on now that everybody uses um, for the most part for all kind of consumer, um, for business to consumer. But do do you feel that, what are your thoughts on kind of the, what they're calling now kind of surveillance capitalism, um, you know, yeah. the, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we focus so long on encryption. We focus for years on encryption. You know, that's what we did in the 90s to fight the, the crypto wars. Um, and by the way, I want to emphasize that when I use the word crypto, I'm speaking about cryptography. I strongly resent uh, the uh, Bitcoin community and the, you know, the digital currency community to use the word crypto for cryptocurrency. Every cryptographer on Earth, without exception, hates this. You know, uh, Hal Finney, who did a lot of the early work on cryptography, absolutely would hate the uh, people calling it crypto. Because Hal was a real cryptographer, like so many of my other colleagues. And we all use the word crypto as the short form of the word cryptography, not cryptocurrency. Uh, I have a sticker on my laptop (laughs) that says crypto means cryptography. Um, So this is generally how I tell if someone doesn't know anything about cryptography when they use the word crypto for cryptocurrency. Uh, That's a sure sign that they're that they that they knew nothing about cryptography. Um, you know, there's even conferences on cryptocurrencies that are called crypto. <laughs> I mean, the conference is named crypto. You know, and uh, all cryptographers uh, strongly object to this. Um, I, that's a digression. I wanted to get back to the main point here. That's uh, cool. we. Uh, we emphasized uh, the, the, the crypto wars in the 90s because that was the matter at hand. But when you look at what we face today, the, the problems of um, our invasions of our privacy are not mainly about cryptography. They're about the larger aspects of cybersecurity. Um, you know, for centuries, there was an arms race between cryptographers and cryptanalysts. And at different times in history, one side or the other has been ahead. Um, in World War II, um, the crypt analysts were ahead. Um, you know, Bletchley Park, breaking the Enigma cipher, uh, breaking the Japanese codes. Uh, that was this, That was the state of that arms race at that time. But today, um, cryptographers are ahead, and they're going to stay ahead until quantum computers come along in about another decade. Um, and, and so when, when we feel like we're ahead, we kind of get complacent. We get fat, dumb, and happy, you know, oh, we have strong cryptography. We don't need to worry anymore. But when you step back and look at the broader aspects of cybersecurity, the attackers have an overwhelming advantage. Um, the injection of malware into your computer that take over your computer and escalate their privileges to kernel level. Um, if, if your opponent can do that to your computer, it doesn't matter how strong your encryption is because the malware can exfiltrate your, your private keys. Um, and so, um, you know, in the broader aspects of cybersecurity, uh, the attackers are, are overwhelmingly ahead and so we have to do something about that one of the few parts of cybersecurity that actually works is cryptography and so the big public policy debate right now about um trying to limit cryptography i mean this this debate is coming back now in the last couple of years um it's it's crazy to talk about that it's crazy to try to roll back uh strong cryptography because it's one of the few things that actually works. Um, so we are in we are in a crisis of cybersecurity. You know, a presidential election can be uh, can be determined by the campaign manager clicking on a PDF file in his email. Um, so you know, cybersecurity can be 
uh, transformative uh, in, in terrible ways. I mean, excuse me, the breach of cybersecurity, you know, the successful attacks against uh, against our servers, against our laptops, against our, you know, devices, you know, these attacks from from uh, foreign intelligence agencies like the Russian GRU can result in putting a, a Russian puppet in the White House and transform, uh, you know, geopolitical relationships all around the world. Uh, so we're in a we're we're in a terrible situation with, uh, regarding cybersecurity. And, and I wanted to to uh, go back to uh, security, or I want to get back to security and privacy here uh, uh, in just a minute. But uh, you, you'd mentioned um, Hal Hal Finney, and uh, you worked with him for many years, and and were uh, close friends with him. And being kind of one of the founders of Bitcoin, he was the the the, the first person um, to you know receive a payment from Satoshi and and mine, and mentioned actually publicly um uh, bitcoin uh, to to the world uh, outside of kind of that the closed cypherpunk uh, mailing list and you know i've heard you kind of talk uh just very briefly uh about him uh in other talks that i've that i've watched of yours uh, but i was wondering if you uh wouldn't mind kind of talking about how you first met hal um just kind of you know the kind of person he was who how he was to work with um yeah how um Hal contacted me right after I published PGP in 1991 uh, and volunteered to help um, help with it. Uh, he um, he helped me develop the trust model. Uh, PGP has a grassroots trust model. When I first released PGP, I didn't have time to implement the trust model because I had missed five mortgage payments working on the release of PGP, and um, it it you know. Software engineers are pathological optimists when it comes to estimating time required to finish a project. And so I had to release it without the trust model. Um, and so I was going to do the trust model in, in PGP 2.0. And that's when Hal showed up and, and said, um, you know, he wanted to volunteer to help. So he actually helped me develop the trust model. And, and I had a couple of other guys helping also on other aspects of PGP. Um, Hal was an extremely nice guy. Uh, he died some years ago of ALS, the same disease that killed Stephen Hawking. Um, uh, Hal was uh, was quite a genius, and it's been my experience uh, throughout my career that you often run into geniuses that pay a price for their genius um, because they, you know, they. It affects their social skills. Maybe it affects their mental health. You know, Hal had none of those problems. He was um, a very nice guy that got along with everyone. Um, and uh, if if they ever made a movie about his life, they would have to have Tom Hanks play him. Um, so um, it's uh, it's a tragedy uh, for him to. Uh, for a, you know, we're it's a terrible loss for everyone that he uh, died from such a ravaging disease. Yeah, just uh, doing you know, as I've you know, delved more into into the space and everything in the history, um, just reading a lot of of what Hal uh, you know would write. There wasn't there wasn't a lot. Uh, you you never really detected any form of. I guess a lack of patience or anything like that. For the most part, it was always you could always kind of very much feel uh, a, a great you know an optimism in a, in a in a great um, just kind of you, you could just tell that 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 was a very nice person that was you know typing uh, these words. Hey, he, on these was, he he was uncommonly nice. He was he was uh, you know unbelievably nice. You know, <laughs> uh, he was thoughtful and and. Uh, um, I had a lot of insights into things, you know, really, and, and he was kind to everyone around him. Um, uh, I never saw how, uh, exhibit anything, uh, you know, he, he, 
he's if he had whatever frailties he might have had, he certainly kept them well hidden. Because I never, I never encountered any in my uh, in my uh, interactions with him. And uh, I remember uh, reading uh, some of something that he written, and he specifically said that he he latched on, you know, because when Satoshi had passed that the white paper around or the original white paper around the, the, uh, within the mailing list, uh, Hallett expressed that he kind of latched on to Bitcoin because in the, the, the term that he used was that he said that the, the gray beards of the cypherpunks at the time had kind of grown cynical and that he was still pretty young, uh, and, and idealistic at the time. Um, you know, why, why do you, I mean, how do you think that that kind of, you know, influenced his life and, and, and why he, um, got into Bitcoin in the first place, you know, this, this kind of idealism, was he kind of just a, was he one of those people that was kind of a, a permanently idealistic person was kind of always looking, um, um, for the, for the, the silver linings in life? Well, you know, um, at that, you know, in the nineties, cryptography was, uh, attractive to a lot of people. It was very political technology and it was strongly connected with human rights. And when Hal volunteered to work on PGP, it was clear that that he was motivated by uh, the desire to help human rights. Um, and uh, and later, uh, when you know the criminal investigation started, um, I I sort of refrained from mentioning Hal. Um, I sort of um, left him out entirely of all public remarks about PGP. I mentioned the other volunteers that worked on it, but not Hal. Because Hal, unlike some of the other guys, lived in the United States within easy reach of prosecutors. And I and he had a family, he had, you know, wife and kids and mortgage and, you know, responsibilities to his family. And he would be um, vulnerable uh, to um, a U.S. prosecutor. And so I, I you know, uh, with Hal's uh, consent, I I stopped talking about him for until the end of the uh, criminal investigation. Um, so, but afterward, you know, I <laughs> I made sure everybody knew that Hal uh, was an important contributor to PGP. I wanted him to get credit for that after the statute of limitations had expired. Yeah, and and he worked. I mean, he worked because uh, after after the uh, criminal cases dropped, you'd formed um, a company, PGP Inc., and then he came to to work with that company. Correct. That's right. Yeah, yeah. He was uh, he was maybe our first hire. Um, so uh, yeah, it was great to have him on board from the beginning. And was he was he still working uh, for PGP when he when he started to kind of tinker around with Bitcoin in its early days? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I remember. Um, I know that he was interested in this concept of proof of work, uh, and I remember talking with him about that. I I talked with him about uh, a project that Microsoft had called Penny Black. It was a way of trying to fight spam by having to solve cryptographic puzzles in order to uh, deliver an email. Um, it, it, it was it, the idea was that spammers were doing mass mailings of millions of emails, and what could we do to slow that down? Not we, but Microsoft had some project to do this, and they had it so that if I want to send you an email, my mail server would try to send this email to your mail server. And your mail server would counter with a uh, request to solve a cryptographic puzzle. Um, and my mail server would have to solve this puzzle, which might involve, let's say, five seconds of computer time. And if I present you the email with the solution to the puzzle, which took me five seconds of CPU time to calculate, your mail server would accept it and deliver the email to your inbox. Um, and the premise here is that if I'm if I'm a spammer sending out millions of emails, I can't take five seconds for each one. Um, and thereby, you know, there was a computational cost, kind of like a postage stamp. 
it was purchased not with money, but with CPU time. Um, and, and Microsoft named it after uh, the earliest postal postage stamp back, in, I think, in the 19th century. Uh, and, and or maybe it was the 18th century, I don't recall. And that it was called, so it was called Penny Black. I remember talking with Hal about this and maybe it could, whether or not it was possible to uh, apply this to stopping spam. Of course, from what we know today, that wouldn't be such an effective strategy because spammers use distributed uh, botnets to send spam so they could distribute the load. But anyway, um, so we were talking about proof of work as a tool for solving a different problem at that time. But I knew that uh, Hal was interested in proof of work for other things. Yeah, because he uh, developed uh, the, uh, I believe it's called reusable proof of work um, off the off the proof of work system. But which which was I, I, like, like you mentioned, there's a lot of people in this in this space that don't understand cryptography. Um, I would say at best, I'm a I'm a casual observer I've, I've read some very topical kind of consumer level uh books on the subject so and, and i'm not a programmer as well so a lot of this stuff is is a lot of uh, me trying to trying to uh um speak the language of a of a of a of a tongue that i'm, I'm not uh, fluent in but um because in, in some of the research I, I, i'd done that he developed what he called reusable proof of work and um was that kind of? I guess you said that you guys were talking about proof of work as a, as a, as a uh, spam. I was just wondering how that uh, that reusable proof of work well, had fit in there. I didn't. I didn't have that many conversations with him about. I, I yeah. Okay. Once once or twice with him about proof of work, uh, and you know, and I I told him about the Penny Black project, and and so I I didn't realize that he was working heavily on uh, using proof of work for cryptocurrency ideas do you think that the future i guess are going to be uh more closely aligned with i guess Hal's optimism or kind of the uh the the cynical uh nature uh of the of what he called you know the gray beards were kind of very cynical at the time uh and he was very optimistic how do you see the future kind of developing for online and digital security um well i have to say that i'm I'm sort of um, disappointed that um, cryptocurrencies have become so admired in uh, fraud. You know, it seems like uh, some large majority of, of cryptocurrency activity is related to fraud. And, you know, uh, there's there's a couple thousand cryptocurrencies, and you know, a vast majority of them are um, scams. Um, so that's kind of, <laughs> and another thing is that even the respectable ones, uh, like Bitcoin, I'm, I'm dismayed at the energy usage. You know, I think that it's a high price to pay if you have to boil the oceans to reach a consensus on this public ledger that is the foundation of Bitcoin. It's using more energy than say Denmark. Um. So, you know, I think that there's going to be a future in cryptocurrencies that would certainly work out a lot better for the planet if it didn't get ever increasing uh, energy usage. A different way of reaching consensus has to be found. There are other strategies. Um, proof of stake is one of them, but there's a couple of others. Um, I, we're going to need something better than um, proof of work uh, if we want to make uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, part of the world economy. I I think that uh, I think that you're you're absolutely correct in that. A lot, I mean, there's there's um there is uh, you know, it kind of depends on who you talk to uh, in in the space and and what they're involved in. But I think that the the concept of uh, especially this is more prevalent in 2017 than any other time, uh, and that was just completely price driven on the amount of ridiculous stuff that was either uh i don't know if you want to call something that was developed with good intentions but didn't work but lost you know people's money a scam but there's plenty of those alongside of actual outright 
um, um, legitimate, not legitimate scams, but actual full out scams in, in, in this, uh, this area. Uh, but that, I mean, usually kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, we saw a lot of that with the dot com boom as well. A lot of people selling snake oil to uh, a lot of investors on on what was versus what was actually what was promised versus what could actually be uh, accomplished. But um, you know, uh, with back going back to the the, the privacy and, and security um, aspect of it, so Bitcoin users are especially vulnerable to a variety of digital attacks if they're not careful. They use something like yeah. you know, Evernote to hold their private keys. That, that's kind of like if you don't, you know, if you make your private keys available, then somebody be able to to spend your Bitcoin or, in the case of PGP, sign messages yeah. on your on your. So, I you know I've always advocated, you know, just obviously the basics of malware, spyware protection, VPNs, long random passwords, uh, uh, two factor authentication. But what would you recommend? Maybe not necessarily just for Bitcoiners, but people in general. What would you recommend someone would be doing right now to secure themselves against those uh, who want to access their well, in, their information in general? There's there's a, a number of problems with um, you know protecting cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, first of all, anything that involves long term keys require really if you want to be sure that you can protect long term keys, like PGP private keys, for example. You really need hardware assistance. Um, some people are using um, handheld tokens like YubiKey or NitroKey. You know, these are USB tokens that hold your private PGP key. Um, and the same should be done for um, Bitcoin wallets. You know, there should be they should be protected by dedicated hardware um, if you want to really be sure. Because if you're not putting them in dedicated hardware, let's say you just have them on your laptop, then if somebody gets into your laptop because you click on a PDF file in an attachment in your inbox, um, then malware, you know, it takes control of your P of your um, laptop and then uh, and then they can exfiltrate your private keys and steal your bitcoins. Um, I, I So you need hardware assistance for that. But you also need something else, which is, what do you do about lost keys? I mean, how many people lose a lot of money? Uh, you know, I've heard stories about people searching through landfills to find disk drives that contain, you know, enough Bitcoin to, to, that, you know, it's worth millions of dollars years later. When they, uh, when they first got that Bitcoin, it wasn't worth so much, but then it became worth more later. Um, you need a way of recovering keys when they get lost. Um, you need a way, you know, and there is a way to do that. There's um, something called secret sharing or a threshold scheme. Um, I, I use um, Shamir secret sharing for uh, making it so that if I, if I lose a device or lose some, or, or what it does, I'm sorry, I should explain what it is. You take a, a, a private key or a secret key and you split it up into shares, and you have to have a quorum of these shares to use it. So if you split it into five pieces, and you need three of the five pieces to put it back together again, then you could lose two pieces, and you know irrecoverably lose two pieces, but you've still got three pieces that you could then put together to assemble the original secret. And that way, uh, you know, if you you know if you put something in a hardware token and you lose the hardware token, uh, you're not screwed. Um, you know if people are going to put assets that are highly valuable in some kind of cryptographically protected um, enclave, you're going to need to do some kind of secret sharing scheme to to split it up into shares so you can recover it if something gets lost. So I think that. You know, there hasn't been enough of that in uh, in the digital currency world. Uh, so you're not just protecting yourselves from hackers getting in, which is bad enough, but you also have to handle what happens if you lose things. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the concept that uh, and kind of the pull between uh, the concept, you know, centralized or custodial, non-custodial or decentralized, right? Because if you have a centralized or... Uh, something like a, a, a bank, uh, a centralized institution, they do provide some very real 
benefits. So if you get, you know, they can reverse transactions, um, or which you know you can we can debate on whether or not that's actually an overall good thing. But uh, they have the ability to recover funds if lost. Where in a decentralized system, uh, non-custodial way of holding funds, then they definitely have that drawback of user error has some very real consequences. Yeah. But what do you think is the biggest? You mentioned uh, the the concept uh, or the the issue with uh, energy usage and, and its effect on the climate already, but uh, other than that, what do you think is the biggest oversight in Bitcoin or or problems that need to be fixed other than the uh, the the proof of work consensus? Well, um, are you asking specifically about Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general? Um, if, if anything with Bitcoin, but if, if, if you, uh, you know, don't have anything specifically with that per se and, and have, uh, more concerns with, with another, uh, project or just a concept in the space, then, then that well, as well. I, I'm, I'm sort of concerned with, um, cryptocurrencies playing a role in autocratic, uh, dictators, uh, evading sanctions, international sanctions, um, uh, laundering money, um, evading sanctions um you know the russians are trying to do this uh they're subject to sanctions and they're trying to use cryptocurrencies to evade those sanctions and uh, you know to the extent that we see uh governments trying to do things with um cryptocurrencies you know in, in a way that's controlled by those governments it you know, in, in a lot of cases, it's because they're trying to evade sanctions. Um, so that worries me about cryptocurrencies. Um, it's not just protecting criminals. It's protecting uh, autocratic dictators, you know, that do an enormous amount of harm. So that's, that's one thing. Um, another thing is... Um, I, I'm trying to understand the premise for why, why there's so much focus on, um, getting away from, uh, fiat currency. I mean, I certainly want to get away from, say, Zimbabwe dollars. I have on my refrigerator, held in place by a refrigerator magnet, a 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollars banknote which I think is probably not enough to buy a cup of coffee uh, because of the crazy monetary policies of Zimbabwe, you know, just printing money. Uh, and, and that's true for Venezuela now, too. You know, uh, that was true of Brazil back in the 1950s. Um, you know, hyperinflation occasionally hits uh, currencies that are irresponsibly managed. But, you know, there's there's good examples of currencies that are that are managed in a very different way. What about the euro? What about the dollar? You know, what about the Chinese currency? These are currencies that are carefully managed. They don't have hyperinflation. Um, uh, you know, I'm happy to use PayPal to make payments. Um, it, I, you know, I don't mind paying in dollars or euros. Um, you know, when I use if I try to use Bitcoin, it's not stable enough in its price to be a real currency. I don't see real currencies going up or down 20% in a single day. Um, so I don't know. I think that there's, there's, the, this, there's this libertarian tendency to um, strongly uh, be against you know, normal currencies because of the of the hypothetical potential that big bad governments might do something bad with them, like print money, you know, and have Zimbabwe dollars be worthless. I I I don't really see that for mainstream currencies. Hey folks, I hope that you're enjoying this episode as much as we did recording it. 
I don't have any sponsors, but if you could do me a big favor and go to iTunes and leave a five star or a written review, that would help me out a lot. You can also help out by going to supportmypodcast.com. That's supportmypodcast.com, where you can find all the other ways that you can help out. If you actually go to the discounts tab, that's supportmypodcast.com slash discounts, you can get on an early mailing list and you will get access absolutely for free as a listener and supporter of this podcast to discounts for such things as VPNs, Bitcoin wallets, Bitcoin related clothing, as well as other kind of health products that I think are very helpful for people to just live a better life. So go over to supportmypodcast.com slash discounts and sign up today. You know, I, I would definitely say that, especially as far as the skeptical nature and criticisms of, of fiat regimes, it's not entirely within, you know, libertarian spheres in Bitcoin, although it, it is highly. I just did a uh, interview recently with uh, an individual who considers himself a European style socialist, but also a fan of Bitcoin as well. Uh, and, and he has many of the same issues with fiat. So it's not entirely just with libertarians, but I'll, I'll definitely see the point that libertarians are uh, specifically obsessed with the, with the concept of, of uh, myself being one of them uh, with, with fiat currencies. I think the, the, the idea is that just like something like Clipper or uh, with, it, with, uh, with what government's been trying to do with you know Apple and whatever it having, I think it's a backdoor... Uh, that fiat is a backdoor uh, to a monetary system and that although they can be managed well today, it does offer that that possibility with, with something like a, a sound money, uh, specifically with Bitcoin, is that it, it precludes that fact. It does not allow someone who comes along and decides that it is within their political interest to, you know, do a massive print up because either they don't understand the economic impacts or they think that that's going to fix a problem that is that is. Um, you know, systemic in the economy, uh, and further and make things worse. Um, I think that's kind of the concept yeah. behind the idea of why we want a currency that can't be outwardly managed in a, in a way. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I, okay, look, one of the, my concerns about, um, the way money is, the way real money is handled like dollars and euros is that, um, if I use credit cards to buy things, then they can see what I'm buying because the transaction is recorded in it in the US at least, they can correlate the transaction with, you know, like if you buy books at a bookstore, the bookstore keeps a record of what credit card was used to purchase these books, uh, which I think they shouldn't do. They should have a separate uh, firewalled, uh, you know, inventory control system that keeps track of how many books they sold by what titles without regard to who bought them so they could replenish their inventory and then have another system that keeps track of credit card purchases, but without identifying what books the people bought, that would be a big improvement. But, um, you know, I would like to be able to make electronic payments without people knowing what I spent the money on. But I, I I'm not sure that cryptocurrencies in the long run, uh, can remain truly anonymous. I know that mathematically, there are some that that can be anonymous, like Zcash. But in the long run, it seems to me that governments, if they wanted to regulate that, if they just pass laws saying something's illegal, they could cause a lot of problems for people who, you know, we imagine that uh, we could defiantly use cryptocurrencies to maintain privacy but i'm not so sure we can if if the government regulates it with the force of law i'm not sure i'm willing to risk prison to use a cryptocurrency that you know the government says you know is illegal um you know it, it's not illegal now but if this because it's not really at scale you know if cryptocurrencies become super popular um, the government can start regulating it the way they regulate money. There are laws that say you're not allowed to do some things with very large sums of money, you know, without reporting it as, as you know, cur there's currency laws, you know, currency transfer reporting requirements. 
you know, if they make laws that cover uh, cryptocurrencies like that, then are people willing to risk prison? Um, do we want to make it so that, do we want to live in a society where a major part of society is, is, is illegal? Yeah, I, I, I think that, I mean, first part is I, Bitcoin is, is a, uh, as it is currently implemented right now and on the main chain is, is a really bad way. And a lot of people using it for dark markets found out, uh, the hard way is that it's a really, uh, not a great privacy tool in that it records every single yeah. transaction on the ledger. It's public. Anybody can view it. Yeah. And blockchain analysis is getting very good. And I'm sure that the various government agencies, um, probably not in 2013, it was pretty, you know, during the Silk Road uh, period, the, that was still kind of in, in its infancy. But I'm sure over the last, you know, five, six years, it's gotten a lot better. Um, you can, yeah. you, know, you go to Overstock and you buy something with that Bitcoin wallet, you are no longer anonymous at all um and you have yeah, to work yeah. pretty hard yeah and not only that but you know um it, we now have a, a new set of laws um that well they're not really new they're, they're laws about capital gains you know if you buy a stock and then later sell the stock and it's gone up in value um that's a capital gains and you have to report that on your taxes and 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 that requires filling out some paperwork, you know, when you sell your stock. Um, well, if I go and buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin, and that Bitcoin has changed its price, which it does so quickly, you know, um, maybe that's subject to a capital gains tax. And th the effort required to like keep track of that may be exceeding the the cost of the cup of coffee. Um, and so using it to make casual purchases, um, runs into the bureaucracy of capital gains taxes, at least in the U S. No, um, yeah, no, it's, it's an absolute nightmare, uh, trying to, cause there is no really, the IRS has set down some rules, but it's, it's ridiculously difficult to try to figure out, um, how to actually claim a lot of this stuff. And uh, it's getting better, but but th that is definitely a concern because it used to be only if you were trading, like this, just for Bitcoin's example, if I was trading Bitcoin on an exchange and I bought Bitcoin with with uh, with U.S. dollars and then I sold it for U.S. dollars, then whatever my gain or loss was is what I would do that. But for a while there was if you had Bitcoin and then you traded for Ethereum and whatever that it, it until it came back out to a fiat a national currency that it wasn't subject to it now because they had the like i forget the exact term but it was used for real estate because they do consider it property and and uh, the irs did for a period i don't anybody out there that's listening i'm not uh, familiar with the tax code uh, myself i have somebody else do it for me but they kind of did treated it like property like if i had a house that was worth you know, a, a certain amount, and you had a house, and we decided to just give each other the house. We didn't trade each other's houses. We wouldn't have to pay any sort of tax on that because it was a like-for-like -like, uh, transfer. And now they don't do that anymore. So it, it is definitely a a, yeah. a, a morass of, of of regulations and and different uh, different laws on the books. You know, I live in Europe, and um, I live in the Netherlands, and, um, and here um, people conduct small transactions using ATM debit cards. Um, they're not credit cards, they're debit cards. And even for tiny transactions, you know, if I buy a cappuccino, it's it's two euros. Um, and I do that every day. And I, as far as I can tell, it's frictionless because I, I don't see the transaction fees. Um, and so I walk around, you know, all week long without any coins in my pocket. Um, because I, you know, I spend two euros on a cappuccino with, uh, with my debit card. Uh, now of course that keeps a record of all my purchases, but if I'm only buying innocent things, it's, it's, it's just effortless to do it. If I was going to do something that I would prefer to keep more private, then maybe I would take cash out and use that. Um, but I don't have a problem in using PayPal to buy something on eBay or 
or um, or use um, my debit card to you know to buy small purchases. Um, I don't mind using other systems to pay for things. Whereas if I was going to use Bitcoin to pay for things, I have to go through a Bitcoin exchange. And I'll even, I don't trust Bitcoin exchanges because I keep reading about how they get their, all their Bitcoin stolen by North Korea or someplace, you know, and, and, or, or maybe they'll, they'll pretend to die. They'll take all my Bitcoins and, and, you know, for, and then, and then pretend to die mysteriously in India while working on helping orphans, you know, and oops, $150 million disappears. I mean, a completely fraudulent, uh, faked criminal death, you know, you know, some guy skips out with 150 million in Bitcoin and pretends to die because he goes to India where you can purchase a death certificate for a modest sum of money. And now he's on the lam with 150 million dollars. And oh, yeah, he died and, and he lost his password and his brain when he died. Uh, well, guess what? The wallets that, you know, that were keyed by that password actually are empty. There are no coins in them. We're dead or alive, you know. That money's gone, and the guy is pretending to have died. I mean, that's the kind of world that I read about in the Bitcoin world. You know, I don't run into that when I do PayPal, you know. I don't run into that when I do normal transactions. I mean, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are so wrapped up in fraud and criminal activity and high risk of loss. You know, I, I opened an account at a Bitcoin exchange um, and then never put any Bitcoin or, or cash into it because I was so worried that, you know, every day I read about another scam where some Bitcoin exchange loses money to hackers or pretends to lose money or somebody pretends to die to steal vast amounts of money. Um, either they're incompetent and they can't hang on to their uh, keys so North Korea can come in and steal all the money, or uh, they're not incompetent, uh, but they steal the money themselves and pretend like somebody stole it, or both. They're incompetent and they steal the money. Uh, you know, I don't run into that with PayPal. I don't run into that with my debit card. I don't run into that with respectable banks. Um, why is, why is Bitcoins, and, and, you know, so rife with this kind of fraud? And this is why I don't, you know, conduct any, any significant, I, I don't conduct any transactions with, uh, digital currency. It's just, I mean, it's an embarrassment. It's just, it, it is just a, a, um, a ghetto of criminality and, and fraud and, and you know, so. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would tend to agree uh, that 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 it is you know embarrassing because when you are trying to talk to people about you know the the the, the aspects uh, the economic aspects of why you know Bitcoin's important and all that kind of stuff and then you know this is what they read in Bloomberg or Forbes. I, I would yeah. say I would say that you know as far as for where the fraud is in the in the industry, uh, the traditional banking industry, I just I, I just think that it's it's a lot less salacious. I mean, there, there's fines constantly about insider trading and all that. I would say that. You know, in the United States, in the 2008 financial crisis, the the the, yeah. the bankers' bailouts and all that was on a, a level because that was all you know, that wasn't even customer funds lost. That was people who weren't even customers' funds being pumped into a into into institutions that 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 were uh, that were unable to to stay solvent. But as as far as for using Bitcoin, I, I do agree as well. It's it, it is difficult, but there are solutions. Granted, you know, the the better ones are custodial, like. Um, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, he's started Square. Part of that is the the Cash App, and you can load it up with you know they work for dollars dollars and euros, and it's kind of like a Venmo, PayPal type system, but they've also instituted Bitcoin now, and you can actually get a debit card. They send it to you in the mail, and you can choose whether you want a U.S. dollar or a Bitcoin balance to be used. And so if I buy like a hundred dollars of Bitcoin, I can use that debit card. Uh, to buy my coffee or whatever, and it just takes it right off that, and, and it subtracts it out of my Bitcoin balance. Granted, well, but, but but wait a minute, but Does it's it, not my own private keys. Yeah, but uh, if you use that card to buy coffee at Starbucks, you're not handing Bitcoin to Starbucks. No, not at all. So, 
you know, the the original vision for Bitcoin was to use it as a currency. But you're not using it as a currency then. You know, Starbucks doesn't get that Bitcoin. Instead, it's it's traded indirectly in some fashion. You know, it's turned into uh, it, like it's exchange for real money. And then the real money is is paid to Starbucks. No, absolutely. I, I just meant it's like we, we talked about it's like really difficult to actually if you have Bitcoin to, to spend it. And, and the this is not the I would not say the, the, the vision of, of way that uh, uh, of that, that Bitcoin to be used, you know, like I would send Starbucks or I would send, you know, Tim Hortons or whoever uh, um, Bitcoin. They would accept that Bitcoin and then trade that for their product. Um, I agree. I'm, I was just illustrating that there are ways to kind of. That, that companies and, and custodial solutions are kind of moving along the way to um, try to bridge that gap between what we want Bitcoin to be used for and what people are comfortable with accepting. Uh, I think is a, there's, there's still uh, a lot more time in between that than sometimes we're willing to, to wait for. But I, I, um, I was, I was actually, I, I just realized that I, I, we were talking about Hal earlier. I was just, had one more question uh, about that was that you'd mentioned that you you guys had uh, talked about proof of work and everything but I was wondering uh, during the time when you were working for him he was starting to kind of do that along the side what did uh, what did he say about bitcoin during that time to you I know that you said later when it reached like dollar parity he was kind of surprised but um, I was just wondering about uh, any conversations that you had with him during those periods of time well, I, I knew that he was working on some project that, along those lines, but he, he didn't talk that much about it at the time that he was doing it, uh, at least not with me. I, I probably had maybe two conversations with him about uh, proof of work. Um, and uh, and so, I, you know, I'm not a good source of information about the details. Okay. Yeah, it's just uh, I, I don't. Uh... I did I did talk to Hal frequently about other stuff, um, but uh, most of the work he was doing in this area, he he, you know, I I only had a couple of conversations with him about. Okay, hey, yeah, it's just uh, there's not a, a lot of, you know, uh, there's a few stories about him, uh, but there's not a lot of like written. Uh, or or audio uh, interviews with people that that knew him that well, and it was just always somebody that, I mean, he had uh, when when he'd gotten he was getting sicker uh, over time. He kind of stepped away from working on Bitcoin. He actually did a um, a, ta- uh, a post, um, I believe it was like in 2013 or even 2014. I'm I'm not sure the exact date. Where he kind of reintroduced himself to the community because a lot, not a lot of people knew who he was, and this was by the time that. It had gotten a lot popular in, in 2013 and 2014. And I just always felt that was kind of such a disservice to him that that he would even have to, you know, reintroduce himself and that uh, there's so many people in, in, the, in you know, Bitcoin that, um, that are newer that don't even know really that, that much about Hal. And a lot of that's just because there's not a lot written about him. So I'm always really uh, excited to talk to anybody that, that knew him about him. But... Yeah, I you know I I found that I I visited him a couple of times when he was very sick, and um, I was impressed with his optimism uh, toward life. You know, it's he seemed to handle the the horrible disease uh, in in some way that I I don't know how he did it, but he he somehow managed to um, you know it's like that Monty Python song. <laughs> always look on the bright side of life, you know, <laughs> he would say, well, he has more time to read now, you know, <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I visited him a couple of times where I sat in the living room and talked with him um, about technical matters. And it was very slow for him to type responses because he had to use his eyes to uh, move a cursor around on the screen to select words. Um, but we, we mostly talked about technical matters, um, 
because that was that was the foundation of our uh, social relationship. Mm -hmm. And there was the elephant in the room of his horrible disease. And yet we sort of, in so many of our conversations, we, we avoided that elephant by talking about what was near and dear to us, which was our, our shared interest in, uh, in cryptography. Um, and so there was a, you know, it, there there was that movie um, Annie Hall, the Woody Allen movie. There's a scene in Annie Hall where he's talking with Annie Hall, and there's English subtitles. Uh, they're speaking in English. This is not subtitles for a foreign language, you know. And they're talking about I don't know what tennis or some innocuous subject, and the subtitles are, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> the subtext of their conversation, right? And and so there was that. Th this was a kind of we were talking about cryptography, but in fact, what was really happening is that uh, this was how I, Hal and I, socialized with each other, and you know, and I felt the tragedy of his of his illness, uh, and knew that it would kill him. And and yet I'm spending all my time with him talking about um, cryptography because that was the the safe, comfortable topic that we always talked about. Um, like you said, he was you know an optimist to the end. You know, I um, I want to be want to be cognizant of of the of your time and and uh, i was just wondering was there was there anything you know that you wanted as far as any kind of closing thoughts uh that you wanted to leave uh with the listeners or just kind of any closing thoughts on on um on the topic of of bitcoin or digital privacy and and how people can uh best put their 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 efforts in to kind of making uh making this a better world yeah you know i I wish there was a way to do a, a cryptocurrency that didn't that didn't bring up so much fraud. Um, I mean, technically, I find it an interesting topic. Um, I occasionally thought of trying to do a cryptocurrency um, because it's just technically interesting. Um, but I'm I'm so put off by the widespread fraud, um, you know. That you look at Steven Seagal. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I'm just so put off by that. And and so that's kind of held me back from, you know, maybe trying to do something with cryptocurrencies. But I, I think that in principle, there's something interesting about having electronic money. Uh, in the abstract. I find it interesting in the abstract, but in the real world of how we empirically observe how it's playing out, it's so rife with fraud that it's kind of disappointing. Um, you know, the, I mean, other aspects of cryptography um, Aren't, it's not like there's a majority of PGP users are criminals. Yes, criminals use PGP, but most people use it for you know good things. Uh, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing the the, the ratio of of uh, you know it's a very high ratio of, of bad things going on in the in the uh, cryptocurrency world. By the way, I was I was speaking at a conference in South Korea recently. Uh, the Deconomy Conference in Seoul, and I was on a panel with uh, Zuko Wilcox, uh, uh, and you know who did Zcash, and uh, uh, Vit Vitalik, the guy who did uh, uh, Ethereum, and we were talking about um, uh, w one of the things that came up on the panel was the fact that people were calling it crypto. <laughs> And all cryptographers resent that. And uh, Zuko suggested that we call them um, Cybercoin. And um, and I, that sounds like a great idea. 
So this, you know, the colloquial term should be cyber coins, not crypto. Uh, so I hope that meme catches on. Uh, Vitalik thought it was a great idea too. So uh, maybe we can spread that meme. It yeah. won't solve the it won't solve the fraud, <laughs> but at least it will make the nomenclature, uh, you know, uh, not as stupid. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah, it's just one of those things. I think uh, it's a it's a catchy word that uh, people latch on to, and it just becomes sort of its own thing. But uh, you know, I'd like to I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Uh, you know, it's been a it's been a great honor to speak to you, and and uh, you know, how can people you know find you and and you know get in contact with you if you want them to, and who would you like to hear from? Uh, well, I I have a website, philzimmerman.com. Um, and you have to spell Zimmerman carefully. It's, it's the German spelling. There's two N's at the end of Zimmerman, uh, philzimmerman.com. And, uh, that has my contact information, uh, my email address, my phone number. Uh, I live in Europe. So if anybody wants to contact me, keep in mind the time zones. Um, I, um, I, I've been living in Europe for four and a half years. Um, and uh and 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 i have other interests <laughs> actually lately my the new project that i'm most excited about is um is a, a project called open book and it's an alternative to facebook um i'm only peripherally involved uh but a friend of mine has uh, started this uh, social network um uh, to um uh, to provide a, a an alternative a non-evil alternative to facebook it's got um, a different revenue model. Uh, it doesn't monetize customer data. Uh, and it, it's trying to do everything right as opposed to Facebook, which does everything wrong. Um, and so ha have a look at that, openbook.social. Um, that's, I find this to be an exciting project. Um, and it's right at, at the time of, this interview, uh, it's a uh, it's an alpha test, and it's going to be moving out to a public beta pretty soon. Uh, so if you go and, and sign up for the beta, um, it's it's a pretty cool thing. Um, it doesn't track anything that you do. It doesn't monetize customer data at all. It doesn't run any ads. Um, it it has a uh, premium version uh, to achieve network effect, uh, but then you it, then it upsells you on. You have to pay money for uh, some better features. Uh, so that's how they're going to get revenue, at least for now, until they come up with something better. There's a Patreon uh, page to sponsor it. Um, and uh, people that worry about the effects of uh, social networks on, on our society, the divisive nature of it, uh, should uh, look at this as an alternative. I think that social networks uh they optimize for engagement because of their revenue model uh and nothing drives engagement as much as outrage and uh outrage uh divides society and polarizes uh the body politic and i think that's terribly harmful uh to the the fabric of society um and so i think we should stop using social networks that do that, especially Facebook, um, and consider alternatives. So that's my, you know, that's the project right now that I find most interesting. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that there's a lot of different, uh, variants that are, that are being proposed or, you know, that we're starting to realize a lot of the issues that, that, that are popping up with what we thought was kind of a very innate or not innate, but a, um, a very innocuous uh, uh, sort of technology just for talking to other people. But I will I will have all the uh, things that we've mentioned here, the uh, Phil's website, uh, open book, every every um, um, thing that we talked about during the interview on in the show notes. So just uh, head over to the uh, website and uh, look for the show notes for, it'll be uh, episode number 34, and we will have that live in, in a couple weeks. And, and once again, Phil, thank you so much. Okay. Oh, I forgot oh, yes, to mention, sir. I also work at the university here, uh, the Technical University of Delft in the cybersecurity department. Um, 
So, um, and, and I also uh, work part time for uh, the local telco uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, KPN. And at, at KPN, I'm working on post quantum uh, public key algorithms uh, to try to bring post quantum algorithms as a hedge against quantum computers uh, to insert these post quantum algorithms into widely deployed protocols like VPNs and open PGP. Um, and so I think we need to get ready for quantum computers, which are some years off, but we need to get ready now. And that's something that I'm actually spending a lot of my time doing these days. Well, I'd, I'd love to have you back on maybe at some point to talk about uh, the post-quantum world. But, uh, but, but thank you for coming on. Sure. My pleasure. All right, everybody. How cool was that interview? Phil is a very, very cool guy. I mean, we may not agree on everything. He may not be the biggest fan of Bitcoin. But you know what? The man is a legend in the cypherpunk community. And without people like him, Bitcoin would not exist. Phil is, a, is an awesome guy, and I was very honored to be able to talk to him. So real quick before you guys sign off, if you could help out by uh, going to supportmypodcast.com, you can see all the ways to help out. Biggest way, iTunes. Leave an iTunes review and a five-star rating. That helps the most right now uh, with anything that you can do. And also, please go and help support the Bitcoin for ALS campaign to honor Hal Finney's memory. Go to Twitter, at Bitcoin the number four ALS at Bitcoin, the number four ALS, or go to Bitcoin for ALS.com. But that's spelt out Bitcoin F O R ALS.com to sign up for the mailing list, to be notified of when the, the thing goes live. We got a lot of pro, uh, prizes and cool stuff. We're giving away treasures, keep keys. Uh, we're going to have uh, hopefully some art um, and some Hal Finney memorabilia like his 1982 Atari game adventures of Tron, which I will be giving away my own copy. So anyways, Thank you guys for listening to the episode. Please support the campaign, the pledge drive. And, you know, I love you guys. You, you guys make all this possible. 